What's the worst that could happen on an airplane? Maybe this. There's not enough oxygen to survive up here. A freezing wind of hurricane force is roaring through the cabin. The flight crew call Mayday, but nobody hears. And the airplane is headed for a mountain. It sounds like a nightmare. For everyone aboard Aloha Airlines Flight 243, this is no nightmare. It's reality. Aloha 243, still up. When crash detectives discover what happened, their verdict shakes the airline business. This accident changed aviation history. Some people choose to trespass in that narrow space between life and death. It's a scary place to be. Surfers get there by chasing killer waves. Just occasionally, fate puts ordinary people, not just thrill seekers, into that same deadly zone where life hangs by a thread. On the afternoon of April 28th, 1988, it will happen in the sky over Hawaii. At 1 p.m., Aloha Airlines Flight 243 is preparing to depart. A Boeing 737 is on the tarmac at Hilo Airport on Hawaii's Big Island, the southernmost of the Hawaii chain. Flight 243 will be just a 35-minute hop to Honolulu on the island of Oahu. Serving the islands means that Aloha works its airplanes hard. They make short flights, but plenty of them. This airplane has been shuttling between the islands since early morning. It'll be its ninth flight today. For the flight crew, it's a routine they've followed for many years. Aloha, 243. Roger. We're just Captain Bob Schornsteimer has been flying for 11 years with Aloha Airlines. Roger. His Roger. first officer, Mimi Tompkins, is hoping for promotion to captain after almost nine years with Aloha. Did you hear any more about... Uh... <laughs> Each of the flight attendants has a long service record too, but none so long as Clarabel Lansing, known to everyone as just CB. Well, Mr. Kiner, welcome. Always good to see you, CB. You fixed some good weather for us. I've smoothed all the way. You bet. She's been flying for 37 years, since before the days of the first jet airliner. Let me help you with this. Oh, yeah. CB is the boss in the cabin, first flight attendant. Michelle Honda, a 14-year veteran, is number two. Jane Sato Tomita has served 19 years. This is one of the most experienced crews you'll find in an airplane that's been crisscrossing Hawaii's islands safely for 19 years. Circuit breakers. It's made more than 89,000 flights. On this day, only one other 737 in the entire world beats that record. Checked. Passengers have no reason to doubt they're in safe hands. Until one passenger, Gail Yamamoto, sees something that makes her pause. But what is it she's concerned about? And how worried should she be? Do I say something? Patricia Aubrey lives in Hilo, but has an appointment today in Honolulu. At first, she opts for the very front of the airplane, in row one. But somehow she feels uneasy and decides to move further back. She chooses a free seat in row 17. At 1.25, flight 243 is ready for takeoff. This airplane often rattles and shakes on takeoff and landing, but it's something the crew and regular passengers have grown used to. What's there to worry about? Though he's the captain, Bob Schornsteimer has chosen to take charge of radio links with air traffic control. It's Mimi Tompkins who'll fly the plane to Honolulu. 
Most of the flight time is taken up in climbing to their cruising altitude. It'll take 20 minutes to climb to 7,300 meters. For many passengers, soaring high over the Pacific is all part of the daily routine. People like salesman Howard Kitaoka in row five, he makes this trip often. When you've seen the view a hundred times, 35 minutes is precious time to catch up on paperwork. The flight's so short that the attendants serve drinks while they're still climbing. They can move around, but the passengers are still strapped in. It's 1.45. 20 minutes into the flight, the aircraft is at cruising height. Honolulu Center, Aloha 243, leveling off at 240. The crew relax. See, where's that National Weather Service weather station out here? Is that in the old tower? In perfect flying weather, everything is following the familiar pattern. Do they? What was that? We have to get down! Lost pressure. I saw a brilliant flash of light and boom. Everything was going, was being sucked out of the plane. Here's what's happened. An explosive decompression has torn away 35 square meters of fuselage. We were in a tremendous blast of wind. The wind blast was unbelievable. A mass of things just went whoosh out the plane, you know, hair was up here. Everybody was in their seat, except the stewardesses. I saw the stewardess get smashed down in the, in the aisle. I could see her hair blowing, and I could see blood, but I, that's all I could see of her. Jane Sato Tomita has been struck by debris at row two. Michelle Honda has been thrown to the floor at row 15. There's no sign at all of CB Lansing. I will take control power. I can't hear you. Only seconds have passed since the explosion. The wind noise makes it impossible for the flight crew to communicate. I can't hear you. Now, for the first time, they gain a sense of what's happened. Visible over a mound of tangled debris, there's blue sky where the airplane roof used to be. The first five rows are now completely exposed to the sky on both sides of the plane. The initial threat of being sucked out is passed since the airplane's now completely depressurized. But passengers are still in danger. My seatmate was flopping out outside the aircraft because at that point, it was just the floor and no walls or seating. And so I grabbed him. The cold and oxygen deprivation are both potentially deadly. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. The passengers don't have any ability to get supplemental oxygen because the critical tubing that feeds that oxygen is now gone. And at 24,000 feet, with very little to breathe up there, the passengers become incapacitated. That's called hypoxia. If you stay up at that altitude for any prolonged period of time, you become more and more physically disabled. With the top of the airplane gone, you now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. High above the Pacific Ocean, an extraordinary drama is unfolding. An explosion at 7,300 meters aboard a Boeing 737 bound for the Hawaiian island of Oahu tears 35 square meters of fuselage from the airplane, exposing passengers to the sky. The cabin is depressurized with no emergency oxygen supply. Unless they rapidly reach a lower altitude where they can breathe again, the passengers will die. Captain Bob Schornsteimer takes over command of the aircraft from First Officer Mimi Tompkins. He begins an emergency descent, dropping 1,200 meters per minute, its speed now increasing to more than 500 kilometers an hour. As the aircraft hurtles down, passengers face a new terror. Wreckage blocks their view of the cockpit, and when the airplane split apart, the nose dropped down by around one meter. 
The plane is held together by just the narrow floor beams. The floor was buckling up, and you could tell the plane was bending in the middle. Michelle Honda can't go forward far enough to see whether the pilots are alive or dead. She tries to make contact via the intercom. Can anyone hear me? The wires are severed. As she struggles forward to try to reach the cockpit, she gets asked the one question she can't answer. Do we have a pilot? I don't know. Do we have a pilot? I do not know. Can you fly a plane? The terror of those on board can only be imagined as she asks the one question no airplane passenger wants to hear. Michelle Honda was coming up and cupping her hands and yelling in everyone's ear individually, can you fly a plane? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, get out of here. Is the, is the pilot gone too? You know, because you couldn't tell if there was anybody up there. Do you know how to fly a plane? No. First Officer Mimi Tompkins tries to alert air traffic control at Honolulu. Recordings from the cockpit voice recorder, the black box, analyzed later by accident investigators, provide a dramatic record of exactly what took place. The nearest place where they can try to land is the island of Maui. Kahului Airport lies between two volcanic mountains. Between them and safety lies a 3,000 meter high summit. To fly from the location of the explosion to the safety of Kahului Airport, the pilot needs to carefully maneuver, avoiding this high ground. Can the fragile aircraft survive the stresses of turning, or if they ever reach the airport, of landing? And how can those on board survive? Jane Satotomita is barely conscious. Howard Kitaoka clutches her hand. The only faint sign of life is once when Jane squeezes back. I'm not exactly sure she was conscious, but I did manage to squeeze her hand, and she responded by squeezing my hand, and we just held hands. The simple squeeze of the hand at a time like that is very, very emotional. Mimi Tompkins is not getting through to Honolulu air traffic control, so she switches to the frequency for the tower at Maui's Kahului Airport. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Aircraft calling tower, say again. Aloha 243. At 1.48, three minutes after the explosion, the crew make their first voice contact with the ground. Aloha 243, see your position. Position to the east of Makita Point. Sending out 11,000. Request clearance into Maui for landing. Request the emergency equipment. Airport fire station. We have an Aloha 737 five minutes out. Approximately 20 miles. Cleared to runway 02. Decompression problem. Pilot is declaring an emergency. Thank you, Mawithar. In the station, in the station. Attention in the station. We have an in-flight emergency. We have a 737, five minutes out, 20 miles. Runway two. Souls on board, cream on board is unknown. It has deep compression travel at this time. Runway two, runway two. Aloha 243. Okay, the equipment is on the field. It's on the way. At 3,000 meters, flying west of the mountain, the pilot slows the aircraft and as gently as possible begins the right-hand turn towards Kahului. Passengers sense that someone must be in control of the aircraft. I've had some training as a pilot, and we were wings level. It wasn't in a dive or a roll, it was wings level. At that moment, I thought, we have a chance. 
Meanwhile, those on the ground are unsure about what kind of crisis they're facing. It's a small airport. An airliner in trouble will test the fire crew's experience. For the air controller, it's hard to hear the airplane at all. Just to verify again, you're breaking up. Your call sign is 243. Is that correct? Or 244. Aloha 243! Aloha 243! Aloha 243. Plan straight ahead for runway 02. I'll keep you advised of any wind change. Four minutes after the explosion. At this lower altitude, they're able to remove their oxygen masks. With their speed having dropped to a little over 380 kilometers an hour, the wind noise decreases just enough for them to hear one another. You want me to call for anything else? No. Aloha 243. Looks like we've lost a door. We have a hole in the left side of the aircraft. But the tower can't hear this new information. They've lost contact with the aircraft. Their transmissions aren't being picked up. Aloha 243, you still up? Is this a radio malfunction or something worse? Aloha 243. Hearing nothing from the stricken aircraft, the controller fears the worst. Aloha 243. Aloha 243, you still up? Aloha 243, if you still hear, please identify. Affirmative. Aloha 243, Roger. I got your ident straight away. Cleared to land, wind 040 at 20 knots. Communication is restored, but the crew's ordeal is far from over. Cabin, do you hear? Now Mimi Tompkins tries to contact the cabin by intercom, but there's no response. Well, the crew doesn't really know what's going on behind them. The airplane is still flying. The captain now has to maintain his focus on flying that airplane but he doesn't know what real damage exists behind him. Tell him we'll need assistance to evacuate. Right. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Can you hear me on tower frequency? Aloha 243, I hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. We're going to need assistance. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. We'll need assistance with the passengers when we land. Okay, you're going to need an ambulance, is that correct? Affirmative. During the descent, passengers experience moments of pure terror. The plane kept vibrating and shaking, and the luggage racks were falling in, and there was electrical wires flying around, zapping, and, uh, you know, pretty much pandemonium, but it looked like the plane was ripping in half. And suddenly, there's a new problem for the flight crew to handle. Your flight manual reversion! What? The flight control feel like manual reversion! It feels to the pilot as though hydraulic systems, like power steering in an automobile, have now failed. The airframe is under great stress. They need to land as soon as possible. Can we maintain altitude, okay? There are so many thoughts that go through your head. Like one of my thoughts was, uh, man, don't put this thing in the water. I mean, you have people around you who are hurt, unconscious. I didn't want to have to say, well, I'm gonna try to save this guy first and that guy first, or whatever, I, and don't put it on the water. The crew fear that critical wiring and control cables may have been severed. Have any of the airplane's vital parts been damaged? Let's try flying with the gear down. All right, you've got it. There are lights to indicate whether or not the landing gear has safely deployed. The main undercarriage has extended as normal. But the light showing that the nose wheel has extended doesn't come on. The last thing the pilot wanted to see, especially with his airplane in the condition it was in, was that he didn't have a nose gear because when the nose touched down on the runway, it would have broken the airplane apart therefore breaking probably the fuel tanks apart, which could lead to a very dramatic fire and explosion. A second attempt to extend the landing gear. The nose gear light is still out, but the radio link is so bad, the tower is still trying to assimilate the crisis. Aloha 243. Just to verify, you do need an ambulance, is that correct? 
I still don't understand. Affirmative. Roger, how many do you think are injured? We have no idea. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. Okay, we'll have the ambulance on the way. There's a possibility that we won't have a nose gear. Now Bob Sean's timer has to make a critical decision. Should he wait for confirmation that the undercarriage is down or land anyway? The textbook in this case would tell the pilots to overfly the airfield so that the air traffic controllers can look at the landing gear and give them a report whether it's up or down. The pilots would then have to maneuver the airplane all the way around the airfield, come in for an approach and land. But with an airplane which might break apart at any moment, that's out of the question. Tell them we've got problems, but we're going to land anyway, even without a nose gear. So they should be aware that we don't have a nose gear indication down. Aloha 243, wind now 050. The emergency equipment is in place. Okay, be advised, we have no nose gear. We are landing with no nose gear. Okay, if you need any other assistance, advise. We'll need all the equipment you've got. Maui is not an ideal place to head for with the damaged airplane. The island's exposed north shore lies directly in the path of the trade winds. I've done that landing a lot of times, and that particular approach corridor is very windy because of the mountain on one side and mountain on the other. So it's a very bumpy approach. But uh, that's basically all we had. Any kind of in-flight turbulence, that would have put great stresses on the front end of the airplane. And there's a high probability that the cockpit would have separated from the rest of the fuselage. Catastrophic loss of the airplane and a loss of life. With the airfield now in sight, Bob Sean's timer has more critical decisions to make. He begins to slow the aircraft for landing. Let's try flaps 15. An airplane's flaps are sliding panels at the back of the wings. To increase lift at low speeds, they need to be extended during takeoff and landing. Is it easier to control with the flaps up? Yeah. Put them back to five. Can you give me a V speed for a flap five landing? No two aircraft landings are the same. Pilots have to factor in many things the wind speed and direction, passenger and fuel load, and the length of the runway before them. Do you want the flaps right down as we land? What? Do you want the flaps right down as we land? Yeah, but after we touch down. OK. A complicated formula provides the VREF, indicating the safe landing speed. Even in a crisis like this, pilots have to reach for the manual. Extending the flaps fully will help act as a brake once they touch down. But to do it earlier could stress the airframe to breaking point. What you have to remember is that the pilots weren't trained to handle a situation like this. With the top of their airplane missing, they became test pilots. The aerodynamic effects of the airplane were drastically different than they were used to. They really had to fly by the seat of their pants. Aloha 243, wind now 050 at 20. The ref 40. Using her flight manual, the first officer makes the complicated calculation that will give their correct landing speed. Right. The safe speed for landing, taking into account the length of Kahului's runway 2, is calculated to be 152 knots, 282 kilometers an hour. As the airplane slows, it becomes much harder to control. And so the pilot has to make another crucial call. Speeding up to keep control means he'll hit the runway faster than he should. He gambles that the higher speed landing is still the best option. Our approach speed, I felt, was hot. I mean, we were coming in hot. I don't know, don't ask me how many miles an hour it was, because I don't know. But from other landings, we were coming in fairly hot. Crash rescue teams prepare themselves for a worst case scenario. At high speed and without the nose gear, a crash landing followed by a catastrophic fuel fire now seems inevitable. 
Under these conditions, the lack of a nose gear could have been a death sentence for everybody aboard this aircraft. A Boeing 737 with 95 people on board has suffered an explosive decompression near the Hawaiian island of Maui. It's still airborne, but only just, with 35 square meters of fuselage missing from the Aloha plane. As they prepare for an emergency landing, warning lights indicate that the forward landing gear has not deployed. If so, the airplane will most likely crash and burn. In the 12 horrifying minutes since the explosion, some passengers are convinced they're not going to make it alive. I thought he was going to go in the water, and uh, I was eaten by sharks. And then we saw the mountain, and I didn't think we were going to make it over it. I just knew we were going to crash into that mountain. And then when we could tell, we could see the airport. And then, you know, then I burned to death because the plane blew up when we, when we hit the runway. Suddenly, the news the pilots have been praying for. The gear is down. Inform Colony Command, the gear is down. OK, thanks. Aloha 243, just for your information, the gear appears down. The gear appears down. You want me to go to flaps 40? Help you? No, on the ground. The crew have had to make life or death decisions. In the next few seconds, they'll find out whether they're the right ones. Michelle Honda cradles her injured colleague as the critical moment approaches. Passengers comfort one another in what may be their last moments alive. A woman that was sitting next to me and her husband, he was on the other side in the next row up. And she was next to me and they were reaching their hands out and they were trying to touch fingers to say goodbye. I was, I was a really touching moment for me. It was when I really knew I was going to die because they were saying goodbye to each other. What gave me the most comfort was knowing that my wife and my kids knew what I felt. That was great comfort. I, I didn't need to tell them anything further, that I love you or, you know, I worry about you, because I felt that I had already said that. Though the forward undercarriage has extended, the crew still can't be certain whether it is locked in place or whether it'll collapse on landing. If it doesn't hold firm, 40,000 kilos of airplane traveling at close to 320 kilometers an hour will smash nose down onto the tarmac. Aloha 243, just shut it down where you are. Okay. Everything's fine. The gear did it. The fire trucks are on the way. Okay, shut it down. Shut it down? In this extraordinary video, captured moments after landing, the amount of damage the airplane suffered is difficult to comprehend. An emergency evacuation of passengers who escaped injury has just been completed. Some injured passengers have still to be helped from the plane. How it flew for those 13 terrifying minutes seems astonishing. Captain Bob Schornsteimer is thanked by passengers who just minutes before had expected to die. The tension is released. Boy, I said, yes, baby. That's all I said. The pilot did a tremendous job. Patricia Aubrey hugs her heroine, Michelle Honda. I was crying, and of course, everybody was traumatized. 
looking at the plane and looking at the people bleeding and just, I kept touching myself going, I'm, I'm here. I can't believe I'm still alive. Her last minute impulse to switch seats saves her from injury, maybe from death. Something was telling me not to sit there because I didn't have a good reason to move, you know. My guardian angel was tapping me on the shoulder and telling me to move. A final desperate headcount by Michelle Honda confirms the crew's worst fears. CB Lansing, the veteran of 37 years flying for this airline, is missing. A sea search begins in the area of ocean where the explosion took place. Neither body nor wreckage are found. Jane Sato Tomita has started to recover. Seven passengers are seriously hurt, the worst injury a skull fracture. But how have the rest survived? At the moment of decompression, it's just their seatbelts which made the difference between life and death. They went poof, loud noise, and it just, uh, the whole thing come apart. And uh, I personally thought we were all gone, and we were uh, faster, all had our seatbelts fast. Well, most of us evidently are, we'd have lost a lot more. But there's something else. At the most critical moment, Maui's notorious high winds died away. I was amazed to see in front of the fuselage missing. What was so funny about the whole thing is that when it came in, it had no wind. I, mean, I believe if you did have that wind, the aircraft wouldn't have made it. It would have split into two pieces. And it's a miracle. It's very much a miracle. This is one of the most remarkable flying events in history. No airplane has ever landed with this amount of damage. The only thing that was holding the forward section cockpit to the rest of the fuselage were the floor beams. Basically, they were hanging by a thread. From a close study of the fuselage, crash investigators try to determine how the airplane structure remained in one piece. The critical factor proves to be the precise location of the explosion. The thing that saved them was that because the damage was across the top of the airplane, as the nose tried to bend down, these members through here are in tension, and it kept them in line and kept them straight. So even though it was almost ready to break off, uh, the structure was still strong enough here to keep it together. If this damage had been along the bottom and the nose is trying to bend down this way, the structure would have been, this similar structure would have been in compression and it would have buckled and the nose would have certainly come off. So it was fortunate that the damage was across the top. How does the roof of a jet airliner simply blow away? The US National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, is tasked with discovering what happened. Investigators pull the airplane's records, something like an automobile service history, and suspicion falls right away on the airplane itself. The best evidence for what happened, the missing fuselage section, is now lying at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. But by carefully piecing together the clues they do have, investigators hope to solve one of the most spectacular accidents of all time. In the 38 years since its launch in 1967, more than 5,000 737s were sold. Somewhere in the world, a 737 takes off every five seconds. The accident airplane was number 152 off the production line, delivered in May 1969. The airplane was designed for a 20-year service life and 75,000 flights. This one had exceeded that number, though many were of short duration. Its fuselage was under constant stress because of pressurization. The fuselage of the airplane is actually breathing. It expands and contracts depending on altitude. When it's on the ground, it's in a contracted status. When it's at altitude, 24,000 feet, the fuselage expands. So the airplane is constantly cycling. That's pressurization. That will weaken the structure over a long period of time. And given the history of this airplane being a very high cycle airplane, that probably had something to do with weakening the structure of the fuselage. With thousands of 737s taking to the skies each day, investigators need to be certain what made this one burst apart. An Aloha Airlines Boeing 737 bursts apart in mid-air over Hawaii. After 13 extraordinary minutes in the air, it makes an emergency landing on the island of Maui. Investigators need to discover what caused this spectacular incident. In Washington, D.C., 
Jim Wildey is one of the NTSB team who worked the case. His expertise as a metallurgist proves crucial. I got a call about two in the morning, in the middle of the night, from my boss, and there had been an accident in Hawaii. They were putting the team together. Uh, I hopped on a plane and, and went to Hawaii. He takes samples from the remaining fuselage and back in the lab discovers something barely visible to the naked eye. Hairline cracks like this, beside the holes where rivets had been. Figuring out how those cracks came to be there means going back to basics, to the way the Boeing 737 was put together. Airplanes are built from many separate panels. Where they overlap, they're bonded together by a powerful adhesive known as epoxy. Rivets hold the panels tight together while the epoxy sets hard. On the Aloha airplane, there's telltale discoloration inside the overlapping joints. Here is the vital clue. You can see now where the dark material is the epoxy that was used to bond the two layers of the lap joint together. The white material you see here is corrosion damage of the aluminum fuselage skin. So the original intent was that the stress that's trying to pull one skin away from the other skin piece, the stresses would go through the bonding and not through the rivets. Of course, as this thing becomes disbonded, now the rivets themselves are loaded, and especially this top row of rivets, and this is the row of rivets we think that had the fatigue cracking in it that led to the eventual opening of the roof structure on the Aloha 737 airplane. The files reveal that Boeing warned airlines, including Aloha, of problems with some early 737s. If the epoxy isn't applied at exactly the right temperature, if the panels have moisture or dirt on them, the bonding can fail. In warnings and service bulletins, some issued over 15 years earlier, Boeing spells out the danger. The Hawaii climate with humid and salt-laden air helps corrosion to occur. But instead of grounding airplanes for a nose-to-tail examination, Aloha has inspectors make occasional checks, often at night, when those on duty are least alert, working under artificial light. Those tiny cracks escape detection. These cracks go unrepaired, and now you have an airplane that is a ticking time bomb. There are other problems. Boeing's service bulletins and what are called airworthiness directives issued by the Federal Aviation Administration are often difficult to understand. Airworthiness directives are very complex and read like a legal document. Aloha needed to have someone who could read that document and interpret it into plain English for the mechanics, the wrench turners. That never happened. An airplane that has been worked so hard, serviced by mechanics who don't fully understand the briefings, is a recipe for disaster. Investigators now believe they know why the airplane burst open, but they don't yet know how. I was flying back from Hawaii to Los Angeles, and while I was in the, in the air, I got a message that, uh, that we needed to interview this passenger who had apparently seen a crack as she was getting on the accident flight. You saw something as you got on this airplane, which uh, you pointed out to your roommate. It's Cynthia Johnson. Yeah. Cynthia, yeah. Uh, talk me through it. What did you see? What I saw was to the right of the door where the paint was white. Well, it was a crack. It was like not a hole exactly, but the metal on top had come away from the metal below. I was going to tell the flight attendant, you know, but they were busy and we had to take our seats. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you figured, you know, they know what they're doing. It's yeah. their airplane. I didn't want to make a fuss or anything. No, 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 absolutely. The witness saw cracking in this area, and we found fatigue cracking back in here. So this is the line where the fatigue cracking joined up. One piece came down this way and folded off, and the other piece went across the top and came off to the right side. But something still doesn't make sense. Boeing designed the 737 and other of its aircraft so that this should never happen. Every 10 inches along the airplane are what are called tear straps inside the fuselage to strengthen it. If a tear begins, it should only reach the next strap before shooting off at a 90 degree angle. 
Though there's a hole in the aircraft, it acts like a safety valve. The purpose of the tear strip is to confine any kind of rip or tear in the fuselage skin to a 10-inch square, basically. If you allow it to propagate beyond this 10-inch square, you could then compromise larger sections of the fuselage and cause a blowout. The 10-inch square allows a controlled decompression and confines any structural damage to a very small area. So why has the safety valve failed here? The NTSB believe there were so many cracks in the fuselage that they simply joined together, running right through the tear straps. The Aloha airplane was kind of unique in a couple of ways. The way it was operated was with very short flights, so you had large numbers of these pressurization cycles, and stress was going on and off on these rivet locations. And secondly, with the disc bonding, all this stress is now going through the rivets, and that led to the linking up of these cracks and then the, the roof coming off the airplane. But is that the final answer on what happened to Flight 243? A new theory claims to shed fresh light on those dramatic events. Matt Austin is an engineer who lives in Honolulu. The story of Flight 243 both appalls and fascinates him. I uh, flew very regularly on Aloha Airlines, and I'd been on that plane about a week before it actually lost the roof. You could tell that something was loose in the airplane. It's just like when you're in an old car and you hit a bump, you can hear the rattles in it that you won't hear in a new aircraft. In this case, when the aircraft landed, uh, there would be noises and rattles you wouldn't hear on the newer aircraft. He begins his own investigation, scrutinizing the 4,000 pages of evidence and photographs gathered during the official inquiry. I am an expert in explosion dynamics and how pressure vessels explode, what causes them to explode, which way the cracks run uh, as they're coming apart. In the case of the Aloha accident, the main focus from the aeronautical industry was they were looking at it as an airplane structural failure, whereas I analyzed it from the point of view of a pressure vessel failure. As he reviews the evidence, one question keeps recurring. Why is CB Lansing sucked out of the aircraft and not her colleague Jane Satotomita? Jane was further forward than CB at the crucial moment. Jane was at row two. CB was at row five. The NTSB believes the roof separation began near row three. Passenger testimony gathered shortly after the incident suggests that CB Lansing was sucked upwards and to the left, but not forward. I was on the aisle on the right. So I look up from my magazine. I see a pair of legs go up and out on the left, just back of first class. From where I was, if the nose was 12, this is at 11, yeah? Forensic evidence suggests another possible scenario. Michael Sweet, an ex-cop, is now a specialist in blood spatter analysis. By studying blood stains at crime scenes, he can help put a killer behind bars or free the innocent. He examines official photographs of the 737 fuselage. This is a, a large photograph of the left side of the airplane. Uh, the front would be in this location. There's a, what we suspect to be a bloodstain pattern on the, uh, right beside the window, uh, right here. Could this bloodstain be where CB Lansing's head impacted with the outside of the fuselage? The analyst believes so. Well, the fact that there are blood stains on the side of this airplane suggests to me that the blood source in this case was momentarily trapped when it came into contact with the side of the airplane. If the flight attendant in this case was ejected outside of a gaping hole, I would expect her to disappear almost immediately and not leave any blood stains on the side of the airplane. This analysis suggests only that she was trapped, but without explaining how or why. Matt Austin believes he has the answer. On April the 28th, 1988, a Boeing 737 owned by Aloha Airlines in Hawaii suffers an explosive decompression in midair. 
Amazingly, it lands safely with the loss of one crew member. Investigators blame metal fatigue due to poor maintenance. But a new and controversial theory has emerged, challenging at least part of the chain of events. What if a safety hole has opened up as it was designed to do, but directly above the flight attendant? Matt Austin believes CB Lansing is sucked into the safety hole, momentarily blocking it. All of the air that's trying to escape has no place to go, so it built up a huge pressure spike, and that's what blew the roof off the top of the airplane. What he's describing is known as a fluid hammer. In scientific terms, air is fluid, as is water. Here's a simple demonstration in a bathtub. The water is, in fact, escaping through the drain. As we move the drain plug back down toward the hole, it will immediately slam shut and create a force, which is a simple example of a fluid hammer. He believes this phenomenon, on a giant scale, caused the accident. It's very tragic, but if we don't look at the forensic evidence that's left, then we won't understand exactly what caused the explosive decompression and possibly prevent the future occurrence. The NTSB say that the fluid hammer theory is valid scientifically, but for them the evidence still points to something simpler, a virtually simultaneous failure in the airplane's many weak spots. The safety board's investigations are never really closed. Uh, and we always would take into account any new information that comes out. Uh, I believe in the case of the Aloha accident, we have, uh, uh, we have not changed our probable cause, and we still uh, are sticking with the probable cause as we determined back in 1988. Since the crucial physical evidence was never found, what happened on board at the precise moment of explosion will probably never be known. Aloha Airlines management took most of the blame for their poor maintenance regime. The NTSB demanded that the Federal Aviation Administration do a much better job enforcing maintenance standards. Boeing had already improved their manufacturing process to prevent the adhesive becoming so easily contaminated. What happened on flight 243 made flying safer. Soon after, Congress passed the Aviation Safety Research Act. This accident had a very profound effect on the aviation industry and the way we look at aging airplanes, old aircraft. We changed the way we monitor how they age, the way we inspect them, and of course now how we manufacture them. We use different processes. This was a very critical accident for aviation history. Those 13 terrifying minutes also left their impact on the survivors of Flight 243. I had to go through a healing process. I took fear of flying classes and, and the old saying of you fall off a horse and you get back on it is very accurate, but it's a lot tougher to actually do it. Patricia Aubrey had to find a way of dealing with the memories also. Her way was to revisit the same piece of airspace where the terror unfolded. I would go flying with my psychologist. You go through what they call desynthesization, where you confront your fear and you just do it so many times that you can do it without having a bad reaction. Before that happened, if something bad happened to me, I'd go, I hate life. But uh, I don't hate life. I can deal with it. Bring it on, I'll, I'll take care of it. Uh, I'd much rather be alive. There's one further legacy of that fateful day. The ocean never did surrender the body of C.B. Lansing. Instead, a memorial garden honoring the veteran flight attendant was planted at Honolulu Airport, beneath the big Hawaiian sky where she spent the better part of her life and where it was so suddenly ended. You wouldn't think it was a dangerous job, delivering the mail. They have to try to land an airliner in a way no pilot has ever done before. We've lost all hydraulics. All the controls are dead. They've become passengers in their own plane, and somehow they have to land it. Even at journey's end, the ordeal isn't over. Yeah.
We have the terrain alarm. We are in an emergency. Baghdad, November 22nd, 2003. Officially, the war in Iraq has been over for months, but the country is violent and unstable. No one feels safe. A civilian cargo plane has just taken off from the city's airport. What's that? Within seconds, the crew lose control, unable to figure out what has happened to their aircraft. We've lost all hydraulics. They struggle to master 100 tons of wide-bodied jet. Their plane is on fire. Unless they can land soon, the wing will burn up. They'll crash and die. Steady. Terrain. They're carrying too much speed. Terrain. They're going so fast, they may not make the runway. No one has ever successfully done this before. By November 2003, the American-led coalition has been in charge of Iraq for six months. The Iraqi army is defeated. Saddam Hussein, the deposed president, remains in hiding. Ominously, the main threat is now from secret armed groups. They're targeting civilians, both Iraqi and foreign, in order to make the country unstable, perhaps even provoke a civil war. They have plundered Iraqi army stores for every infantry weapon there is, even surface-to-air missiles. Baghdad is a very dangerous place. Dawn, on the outskirts of the city, Claudine Vernier-Pallier from the French weekly magazine Paris Match, with her photographer Jérôme, is going to a secret meeting with Iraqi terrorists. She's after the story that everyone wants. Who are they? What do they want? The previous day, she had met the leader in a hotel room. He called himself Abu Abdallah, but no one knew his real name. <laughs> Evidently, this man was very, very determined to stop at nothing to show the Americans that he wanted no more of them, at least not their military tactics. Baghdad airport, key to the US presence in Iraq. Military planes fly in daily to supply the troops and to help rebuild the shattered country. Because of the threat from Iraqi terrorists, the US has established a security zone around the airport, patrolled by Apache helicopters. On the tarmac today is one of the few civilian aircraft to use the airport, an Airbus A300, belonging to the courier firm DHL. They have won the contract to carry the soldiers' mail. They led us down little roads for a long time to be sure we would lose our bearings. At the hotel meeting, Claudine and her photographer had arranged to meet the rebels at dawn the next morning to take pictures of the fighters with their weapons. We arrived in a field where we met other vehicles, among them a pickup truck. The men got out of the cars and just off the road, hidden under some branches, the men recovered some weapons and some missiles. They loaded their weapons in their vehicles, and Jérôme took the pictures we wanted. The journalists have got the story they came for, but Abu Abdallah is not finished with them yet. He tells them to follow. They don't know where. Et puis il m'a dit que maintenant ils avaient l'intention de tirer. And he told me that a new phase in his resistance actions would be to shoot missiles at planes. A few kilometers away, the DHL plane is getting ready to depart. 
Two flights a day shuttle post and packages in and out of the war zone. Baghdad Tower, Oscar Oscar, Data Lima Lima, Airbus A300 cargo, apron and information Sierra, request standard. The Australian Air Force is providing the air traffic control in Baghdad. Oscar Oscar, Delta Lima Lima, clear to start. Before start checklist. Start two. Captain Eric Genot is Belgian, 38 years old and single. He realized his dearest ambition a year ago when he qualified to captain the Airbus A300. In 2.45. Valve closed, EGT 610. Flight engineer Mario Raphael lives in Scotland with his wife and children. At 54, he's the oldest and most experienced member of the crew, a veteran of many danger zones. Start one. Valve open. The 29-year-old co-pilot, Steve Michielsen, is also Belgian. He's been married just three months. Cargo airlines are great places for young pilots to get the hours and experience they need to pilot commercial aircraft. Zero, 16 Kruger. DHL has been flying into Baghdad for six months. There's no danger money for crew. The airport is an oasis of calm in the middle of a chaotic war zone. Nevertheless, they're aware of what's going on around them. When we were crossing already the border from Kuwait to Iraq, the ambience in the cockpit already changed. You have a kind of stress, at least for me. The journalists have been taken to another location by the terrorists. By now, they're beginning to get uneasy. They'd like to leave, but they have no idea where they are, and they feel that a dangerous situation will develop if they attempt to go. So, what's going on here? We're going to do special operations today. You'll see. I'll show you. This is Sam 7. We have them from the old Iraqi army. We have approximately 28. We got them from two different Iraqi army depots. We have already fired about 25, and we only have three left. They are heat-seeking missiles, equipped with homing devices which detect infrared emissions from a plane's engines. This Sam-14, better than Sam-7. We don't have so many. I think we should use this one today. He was very good before. We shot down a plane near Nasriya, and my fighters recorded 177 dead. And we shot down another plane with Americans on, and we killed 70 men. But no one had ever heard about this. I didn't believe a word of it. From all over Baghdad, you could have seen it. So I thought the guy was making it up. So what are you going to do with this one today? What do you think? We're going to shoot down a plane. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> the journalists are getting worried. What if he's not bluffing after all? This is not the story they came for. <laughs> it's early in the day at Baghdad Airport. A DHL Airbus A300 carrying letters home from US soldiers is just departing. The crew is unaware that just a few kilometers away, a terrorist group has its own plans for the aircraft. Oscar, Oscar, Delta, Lima, Lima, cleared for takeoff. Takeoff. The plane is a 24-year-old airliner converted to carry cargo. Its first stop will be the Persian Gulf state of Bahrain. It's a journey they make twice a day. 100 knots. V1. Rotate. Positive climb. Despite the calm in the cockpit, the crew knows that below 3,000 meters, they're vulnerable to attack from the ground. So far, no plane in Iraq has been hit with a surface-to-air missile, but it's known that the terrorists now have such weapons. It's a strange ambience, it's a strange feeling. Between the time you take off and you reach 10,000 feet, you know that 
You are in danger. Gear up. Gear up. No lights. Meanwhile, the terrorist leader, Abu Abdullah, appears to have chosen his spot. He asked us to park our cars pointing outwards so that everybody could leave in a different direction. That's when I should have realized that the bluffing was over. The journalists are now very alarmed. They cannot leave. They're trapped. This is video shot by the terrorists themselves. They'll deliver it to the media in Baghdad the next day. three hydraulic systems. They are uh, identified by color, which one is the green and yellow and blue. Big jets depend on hydraulic power. Hydraulic fluid runs inside pipes throughout the aircraft. When the pilots move the control column, pistons push the fluid in the pipes to climb, descend, or turn the plane. With no hydraulics, pilots have no way to control their flight. The missile has exploded in the wing, where the pipes filled with hydraulic fluid are now draining. It's like driving a car at speed and suddenly losing the steering wheel. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What could I answer? What could I answer to him? It was a, a very, very difficult question he asked me. My initial reaction was, Ooh, we have to do something. And I asked to the captain, like, what shall we do? Or, or any ideas or something? And he said, we had, his initial reaction was, we have to go back. A big jet can survive with one of the three hydraulic systems knocked out, maybe even two. But all three? None of the controls will work, period. I think we hit something. Blue is gone. Bank angle. Bank angle. We've lost all hydraulics. All three hydraulic systems gone. There's nothing left. The life of the aircraft is now measured in minutes. That was the end of everything. Procedures, uh, what you've been trained all these years. and So all you needed then is uh, to keep calm, common sense, and of course, here where your experience comes, to, to see whatever is left there. But we had uh, nothing to, to come back to or read or do or follow. The control columns have become useless. Without the crucial hydraulic system, there's no way of moving the controls. 
when you have this kind of of emergency, the three needle showing zero, and the flight engineer saying you all it really gone, you are terrified as well. It was fear. We had no control of the aircraft, of course, initially. But the aircraft continued to climb at that time uh, until about 12,000 feet. The plane has started to behave strangely. It climbs to nearly 3,800 meters, then suddenly starts to dive of its own accord. Sink rate. Then it climbs again. Sink rate. Sink rate. It will not fly. Sink rate. Back, back. Sink rate. This cycle repeats itself over and over again, like a mad roller coaster ride. The crew can't stop the plane's wild gyrations. They're still airborne, but somehow they must regain control. And no, Eric, are you, are you proud of yourself? You look in each mess you are. You know it was dangerous to come here. And how you will, what you will do now to get out of here. I play with controls. Reduce thrust. By moving the throttles to and fro, perhaps they can flatten out the huge dives and climbs. It's all they can think of. And then I decide to take the challenge. We have to come back. There is no training to fly a plane in this condition. So from that time and on, all the books and the procedures and this, they're out of the window. We have engines. We can use the thrust. All they have left are the two engines, which are undamaged. But how do you fly and land a plane with engines alone? No airliner has ever done it. Certainly not this one. In August 1985, a Japan Airlines Boeing 747 had suffered a catastrophe minutes after leaving Tokyo. The bulkhead at the back of the cabin burst open. The force of the rushing air blew off most of the tail fin and cut all the hydraulic lines. Without hydraulic power, the pilots of the 747 were little more than passengers themselves. A jet with 524 people on board, flying over the mountains of central Japan, was virtually helpless, swaying in the sky like a drunken bird. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. When the 747 hit a mountain, it was the worst single crash in aviation history. 520 people died. Can the DHL crew succeed where the Japanese pilots failed? The first task is to try to calm the wild plunging of the aircraft. The airplane will tend to go into what's called a fugoid in the vertical uh, mode. It will descend, speed up, therefore pick up more lift, then it would climb, pitch up and climb, it would slow down, lose lift, and so it would go into this and it was very difficult for the pilots to control that. They have to do it by using engine power alone, the only thing they have left. They find that if they reduce engine power, the plane's nose drops and they begin to gather speed. If they then push the throttles forward, the nose comes up and they start to climb but they have to learn precisely when to increase and decrease power. Main angle. Main angle. And there's another complication. The damage to the left wing is creating drag on that side and pulling them round to the left in a wide circle. One of the, of the most difficult things to master, to keep the pitch attitude in a normal way, was already difficult enough. And now, on top of this, we had to use asymmetrical thrust, 
because the airplane was banking to the left all the time. There was a part of the left wing which was gone. Bank, bank. So they not only have to move the throttles back and forth to flatten out the plane's roller coaster motion, but also try to apply more power to the left engine to compensate for the damaged wing, which is causing it to lose lift. After several minutes of violent pitching up and down, the crew managed to flatten out the flight path. Even after we've learned how to, to fly it using the throttles, we still went through, uh, I would say three to four times, we went through un almost uncontrollable condition, you know, un couldn't control the aeroplane, like very steep dives and uh, banks. By now, the crew realize that they've been hit by a missile somewhere on the left wing. Their Airbus has become the first civilian aircraft casualty of the war. I knew we were on fire, that I knew it. So my intention was to come back and land the aircraft. And also, I was, we were afraid, I was afraid to be shot at a second time. Their fears are justified. The terrorist leader, Abu Abdullah, is waiting for a second chance to finish them off. Iraqi terrorists have fired a missile at a civilian plane near Baghdad airport. The left wing is on fire and the crew is in desperate trouble. Now the terrorists aim to finish it off. They launched a second missile that missed a plane this time. And then he told everyone, let's go. And we all left quickly. <laughs> Madame Vernier-Pallier later came under a storm of criticism for not doing more to stop the attack, or at least leave the scene. I think that any journalist in a situation we were in would have reacted exactly as we did. We have been criticized for not having said to the group leader when he told us he was going to fire on an aircraft, no sir, we're leaving now. On the one hand, if we had said that to him, it would have meant a bullet in the head, that's clear. And on the other hand, right up to the last minute, right up to the time when they fired a missile, I didn't think they were going to do it. I thought they were still bluffing. While we were trying to find our way back with our chauffeur, we saw that the plane, its left wing was on fire. It was now turning like this. It was like in a film, it was unreal. And it was only when we could see the plane on fire that we thought of the people on board. And then we were scared. I realized the plane could crash, that it would crash. And then I started to realize, why had they done this? It so happens we were there, we were filming, we were journalists, and we were French. So it seems evident that they had set us up. By the time we realized this, it was too late. Everything had gone too fast. The crew knows nothing of the second missile. Hey, Graham, did you guys say there's an aircraft on fire? This remarkable video, seen here exclusively for the first time, was shot with the infrared heat-sensitive camera of a US Apache attack helicopter. Apaches routinely patrol the area around the airport, watching out for terrorists. Take time at 5-4, Tim. Roger, 5-4 is observing the uh, aircraft inbound under our sighting system. He's got, uh, appears to be a fire on his far left uh, engine. The intense heat of the fire on the Airbus shows up as a blur on the helicopter's heat-sensitive camera. That's Lima Lima. Lima Lima, We have a bit of problems controlling the aircraft. There was a helicopter flying, and he could see that the fire was not from the engine, but it was from the left wing. So it gave Mario the opportunity to ask the tower again uh, if they could still see some flames or smoke coming from the airplane. 
Could you confirm if there's smoke coming from the aircraft or fire or anything like that? Sir, Dragon Chamber 5-4. You can still see smoke and flame coming from the left tip. Of the left wing. Okay, left wing tip, uh, fire and smoke, huh? That's your problem. Thank you. We were on a, on a heading towards the airport. We could see the airport. Levante gear. Can I take control? No, I have control. Look, I have control. Lower the gear. With no hydraulic power, Mario has to crank open the landing gear doors and let the wheels drop down by gravity alone. The captain said, in fact, we have to land. And he called for the gear down, which is quite a normal thing to go and land. But it has an unintended effect. Lowering the landing gear has altered the entire balance of the aircraft just when they thought they'd figured out how to control it. It causes the nose to point high in the air and the speed to fall. No, no, no the speed! It could easily stall and then crash. I didn't expect that at all, and I saw the, the, the aircraft are taking a pitch up, and then the speed decreasing, 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 and I was retarding the throttle and say, no, 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 no. It... The nose has gone up, their speed is falling, they're about to stall. They have no choice but to pull back the throttles to bring the nose back down again. They're nearly at stall speed. That would have been the end of it. We would have fallen out of the sky. I was afraid that maybe one wing we stole, and on this time it's finished. I think I'd rather try to crash on a runway than crash into the desert. Yeah, and trying to land on a runway where you can just belly up in the desert in the yeah. sand, sand would probably put out any fire. Cautiously, they managed to coax a bit more speed from the engines. Lowering the gear brought them to the brink of disaster, but now the plane is easier to control. The airplane miraculously became more stable afterwards. That's one of the first factors which proves how lucky we were that day. Let's land. Tower, Delta Lima Lima. Oscar, Oscar, Delta Lima Lima, Baghdad Tower. Can you make approach now? Runway is clear for landing. The Apache helicopter has been joined by others who are powerless to do anything but provide information to the stricken DHL plane. It looks like it might be too high, I guess. I'm still looking up at the flare. Come on, buddy. You could hear other aeroplanes talking at the same time. Oh, crap. And uh, that, on its own, uh, was a bit difficult. Oscar, get down to Lima, Lima. Could you please... Uh... Oscar Oscar Delta Lima Lima, runway 33 left is available as well if you need to land there. Okay, keep both runways open for us. No more talking, bye. Tank 1 Alpha is empty. Fuel has been steadily streaming out of the tanks in the left wing. Bank now eagle. one of them is empty. Back, back. Bank angle. Yes, got it. Bank angle. Release it round. Left wing coming up. Against all the odds, they've made it back to the airport. An incredible feat of flying. They begin making preparations to land. Which runway? We use 3 3 right, I think. Uh, Lima, Lima. Uh, Lima, Lima, go ahead. Could you please declare full emergency? Yes, we need the fire brigade because our landing gear might collapse as well. Uh, Lima, Lima, all available assistance is available on the field. Everyone is on full alert. Okay, thank you very much, and, and no more calls. Uh, that guy's got a... He's pretty stressed. Rightfully so. But on the brink of success, it begins to unravel. 
But at that time I realized that we were a, bit, a little bit too high to come in and land uh, in, that, in the situation we were. That's what I thought as well, we're too high and too near. We must land. We are too close, we need a land final. I mean, Steve brought a very important point here, and I think it was a, a really a saver. Steve is giving his captain news he doesn't want to hear. He can't land. They're too high and too close. If they attempt a steep descent, they'll bury it in the runway. Eric Janot will have to turn around, fly away from the airport for 37 kilometers, turn again, and come back on a long final approach, slowly descending. If we haven't done this 20 miles, we would have been circling there forever, and until we dropped to the sky or the wind. You can't make it, it's impossible. Keep the speed up, keep the speed up. I try, I, I will do the best I can. And then I, I realized they were right. We have to go on long final. But for the last 13 minutes, the wing has been on fire. Do they have enough time? 20 miles final. OK. It looks like he's still pretty high. You got that sight now? He's still got a long way to go. Though. Yeah. Well, it looks like he's turning like an extremely extended final. Yeah. And I don't think I can make it in. Time is running out. The fire is eating up the left wing. They're still heading away from the airport. Then they have to turn and make a 37 kilometer approach. Can they land before the wing fails? If for a mistake we stayed another 15 minutes in the air with that fire still burning, and maybe that tip of the wing would have broken off. And again, the results would have been disastrous. Two main structural spars give the wing its strength. The missile has made a five meter long crack in the rear spar. Too much stress and it will snap like a twig. There's another danger. Fuel is streaming out of the punctured tanks in the left wing. If the tanks run dry, an engine will stop and they'll crash. We were controlling the bank and the pitch of the aeroplane using the two engines. So if we had lost one engine, then we couldn't do anything with the other engine. So the end result would have been disastrous. Despite the fire, the crew's confidence is growing. Now they have some control over the plane, but the prospects for a safe landing are not good. This is the closest any commercial jet has got to a safe landing with no hydraulics. In 1989 in the United States, the crew of this United DC-10 lost all their controls after an engine blew up and turbine blades shredded the hydraulic pipes. The pilots managed to regain some control, moving the throttles backwards and forwards like the DHL crew. There were 296 people on board. But at the last minute, as they approached the small provincial airport of Sioux City in Iowa, disaster. Of the 296 people on board, 111 died. So within four years, two major airliners had crashed because a loss of hydraulics had crippled the planes, killing 631 people. In its investigation report on the Sioux City disaster, the US National Transportation Safety Board asked for urgent research to find ways of controlling big jets that had lost their hydraulics. But over Baghdad, 14 years later, the DHL crew only have their wits to help them as they try to land. I remember the story of the DC-10 of Sioux City that it has been done before. The only control we still have on the aircraft in the cockpit was the engine. Nothing else. The crew are now 28 kilometers away from the airport, getting close to where they will turn in order to make their long final approach to the runway. 15.2. 16. Now we turn right. Not yet. This is where uh, experience counts now, and you have to rely on what you know. 
we were pretty sure that we were going to be able to make it to the airport, but we were absolutely not sure that we were going to be able to make it to the runway. 16.5. Now we turn. 17 miles. Now we turn. The only way they can turn is by applying more power to the left engine to make them go right and vice versa. They're swinging round to the right, trying to keep the plane steady and descend all at the same time using nothing but the engines. Airport at 340, come right. Now 320. Turn nice and stable, keep speed up. Yes, yes. 4,000 feet. 500 feet. 3,200 feet. You turn on the head. Against all their instincts, they'll have to keep the speed up on landing or the nose will drop and they'll crash. They should be landing at around 300 kilometers per hour but they're coming in 100 kilometers per hour faster. No one knows if the landing gear will take the strain. As they reach 120 meters, the hot air from the ground and strong wind blowing across their flight path upset all their plans. The wind coming from the left and the turbulence, we were drifting to the right. That's where the airport building was. Bumpy. As the plane approaches the runway, the nose is pointing dangerously low and the left wing is dropping. Think right. Come on, buddy. They're carrying too much speed. They could overrun the runway. Keep the speed up. We are going left. Yes, I increase. If we go to Iceland landing, maybe off the runway. They are landing three, three left. Fire trucks on standby. Medivac on standby. Steady. Steady. You are approaching the end of your life. You realize it. Terrain. Pull. Terrain. Come on, buddy. 30. Back. Terrain. Okay. Pull. Terrain. 20. Terrain. 's Airbus has managed to land through an incredible feat of flying but their troubles are not over nice landing well confirm eva evacuate evacuate evacuation both I handle Final irony, after getting safely to the ground against all the odds, one more unforeseen danger. 
Straight floor. Hey, guys! Don't move! That area has unexploded ordnance! Do not move! What's that? He's saying there might be bombs here. I don't believe this. We're coming to get you! The area is still littered with unexploded bombs and shells left over from the battle to capture the airport from Saddam's men. Now we get to you, we're gonna back up and you gotta follow in our tracks. Now we're gonna get you out of here. But you gotta walk right in my wheel tracks, okay? Keep coming. Keep coming, it's not much further now. For the first time, the crew can see the damage for themselves. They've survived the unsurvivable. No crew has ever successfully landed such a badly damaged airliner. They had to learn and practice a whole new flying technique. But the remarkable thing is, had they known it, the technology had already been invented to save any pilot in this desperate situation. DHL pilots have managed to fly and land a plane without any flying controls. It's the first time it's happened. Two earlier occasions, near Tokyo and Sioux City, Iowa, ended with the loss of over 600 lives. In 1989, NASA began to investigate ways to land crippled aircraft using only throttle controls. Engineers and pilots came up with software that could cope with total hydraulic failure. It's called PCA, for Propulsion Controlled Aircraft. The PCA concept is simple. Pilots tell the aircraft's flight management computer what they want to do, turn, climb, descend. But instead of sending those commands down hydraulic lines to the control surfaces, the computer orders the engines alone to do it. To test this software, this MD-11 aircraft is landing with no hydraulics and using engine thrust alone. The pilot is not moving the throttles. The PCA software is doing it all for him. Though none of the plane's normal controls were used, the MD-11's landing was not only survivable, but very similar to a normal landing. I believe that the DHL uh, incident has revived interest in, in propulsion-controlled aircraft system as a, an augment to uh, perhaps the systems that we have uh, in today's aircraft that would, uh, would certainly mitigate the, the uh, damage that could, be, that could have been done uh, to this aircraft and certainly could mitigate the damage done to an aircraft carrying uh, five to six hundred people. One of the enthusiasts for the PCA system is Captain Denny Fitch, one of the pilots who survived the Sioux City DC-10 crash. This is just absolutely an amazing piece of equipment. What they have done and what they have achieved in the success ratio that we have, the survivability that we now have with modern aircraft completely controlled in hydraulics, to have this occur again and have this aboard the aircraft is a very warm feeling as a pilot. Blue is gone. We've lost all hydraulics. America's Federal Aviation Administration conducted research into PCA, but soon abandoned it. It says the risk of losing all hydraulics is too low to make systems like PCA worthwhile. The FAA's conclusion after their studies was that these events are so rare as to not require the mandate of an additional system. And of course, they did not consider the event of, or the possibility of a surface-to-air weapons attack on the aircraft. The DHL is the first plane in Iraq to be hit by a surface-to-air missile. But in recent years, the threat of terrorist-controlled shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles has been growing. There had been roughly 30-odd incidents of uh, commercial aircraft being attacked by manned portable surface-to-air missiles leading up to the DHL one. 
What makes the risk of missile attack in Iraq so serious is that for months nobody was guarding the abandoned depots of the Iraqi army, leaving terrorists free to help themselves to millions of dollars worth of arms. I believe there are weapon caches everywhere in Iraq. In my opinion, they also have many missiles. There's widespread fear these terror weapons could soon be targeting passenger airliners all over the world. The US government's Department of Homeland Security is spending over $100 million on research to adapt military counter-missile technology for civilian airliners. It, it is inevitable today that commercial aircraft will have to be fitted at some time with laser and infrared jamming systems. The infrared jammer will confuse the seeker for the uh, missile, whereas the laser jammer will direct a pulse into the seeker and burn out the seeker of the missile. Singapore Airlines, Qantas Airlines, they're all looking to install something into their aircraft. If you look at things like the Queen's flight in the UK, the President's uh, aircraft in the USA, and the King of Jordan's fleet, they're all fitted. Terrorism is with us today and will always be with us for the rest of our lives. It's impossible to defeat terrorism, but what is possible is to control terrorism at a commercially acceptable level. If we don't do that, then there's no future for us. But miraculously, without any of this equipment, the DHL crew had brought their plane to a successful landing. It's the only confirmed occasion in history when a missile has exploded on a large civilian airliner which has then landed without crashing. For Mario Rofeo, it was a good note on which to retire. It was a good time actually to say goodbye yeah, to aviation. As I said, I've been flying for 30 years and um, clean record, even to the last minute. We were lucky, but also we worked. We, we fight to survive. I learned some things about, about life, maybe, but I don't think it makes me a better pilot. The three DHL crew have received some of the highest awards that the civilian aviation community has to offer in recognition of an unprecedented achievement. Teamwork was absolutely the key factor of uh, bringing the airplane back to the ground with all, speed, all three people alive. On December the 30th, 2003, five weeks after the missile struck the DHL airliner, US General Mark Kimmett gives his daily press briefing in Baghdad. Of note on Saturday, Sarhid Ab Sarhid, a former directorate of military intelligence officer suspected of leading a large anti-coalition group in the region and suspected of the downing of the DHL jetliner, died at a coalition medical facility from wounds received in a targeted raid on his complex. The Americans believed they had killed the leader of the group that fired the missiles at the DHL. Claudine Vernier-Pallier is not so sure. So I thought he was dead. I tried to verify this later. He wasn't dead, and it wasn't him they got. And my photographer returned to Iraq and saw this person again. He was still alive. <laughs> In the fog of war, no one can say for sure whether the man who called himself Abu Abdallah is still alive. But what is certain is that the threat of further missile attacks on planes, both military and civilian, is still there. This is the story of one of the most tragic incidents in aviation history, of how a jumbo jet goes berserk, plunging up and down at 7,300 meters of how an innocent mistake made years earlier puts over 500 lives at risk, and how investigators literally stumble on the reason behind the biggest single air crash in history. Japan Airlines Flight 123 is uncontrollable. Next. We 
We are in an emergency. This may be the last video ever taken of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's late summer, and millions are traveling home for a traditional Japanese holiday. Something exploded. Japan Air 123 request. The plane is only 12 minutes into its flight when terror strikes. It's out of control, plunging up and down hundreds of meters at a time. And it's headed straight into the mountains that surround Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan. On the ground, Japan Airlines staff search frantically for the cause of the problem. In Tokyo, air traffic controllers try to guide the plane to safety, while the pilots resort to desperate measures to keep the plane aloft. Tokyo, Japan, August the 12th, 1985. In most of Japan, it's the eve of Obon, when people traditionally honor their ancestors, often returning to their place of birth for family reunions. Tokyo's Haneda Airport is crowded, with thousands trying to get home. On the tarmac, jumbo jets are lining up. Air travel is so popular here that Japan Airlines has to use 747s even for its short internal flights. Tokyo Area Control handles all aircraft over central Japan, including those on their way to and from the city's two big airports, Haneda and Narita. It's six o'clock in the evening, but the rush won't be over for hours. Crowded passenger lists and busy controllers make it a typical holiday weekend. Roger, approved as you request. Cathay 456, turn right on heading 250, climb and maintain flight level 240. At Haneda Airport, Japan Airlines Flight 123 is boarding. Among the passengers is young Yumi Ochiai. She's actually a flight attendant for Japan Airlines, but today she's off duty. Yumi takes a seat, four rows from the back of the plane. At 6.12 in the evening, flight 123 takes off heading for the industrial city of Osaka, 400 kilometers to the west. It's filled almost to capacity, 509 passengers and a crew of 15. Japan Air 123, contact Tokyo departure. Roger, Japan Air 123, Air 123. Captain Masami Takahama is 49 years old and one of the airline's senior training captains. On this flight, he'll be handling the radio and keeping an eye on the first officer who's sitting in the captain's seat. Yutaka Sasaki is flying the plane. He's hoping for promotion to captain. Hiroshi Fukuda, a veteran flight engineer, is the third man on the flight deck. Tokyo departure, Japan Air, one, two, three. Passing eight, uh, 800. JAL 123's route will take it south over Enshu Bay then southwest along the coast, until finally taking a sharp right turn to land in Osaka. The flight will take 54 minutes. Flight 123 is leaving Tokyo behind, climbing to 7,300 meters. 12 minutes into this short flight, the plane's black box shows that all is going well. Hello, pet, what's the problem? Someone wants to go to the restroom. Shall I let him? The plane's black box records a routine request from a passenger. He wants to use the bathroom before the seatbelt light is turned off. Careful, please. An ordinary request on a routine day. Something exploded.
air is rushing out of the cabin. The oxygen masks drop down automatically when the air pressure falls. The explosion, the sudden loss of pressure in the cabin. There must be a hole in the aircraft. Gear door. Check gear. Gear. What? Check gear. Gear. The pilot's first thought is that the landing gear doors have blown off. Squawk 77. 7700 is the emergency code. When the crew radios this code to the ground, air traffic control will know the plane is in trouble. Every plane on the controller's screen carries a label, giving the plane's identity. Suddenly, the label beneath Flight 123 changes. Someone in the cockpit has keyed in the emergency signal. The plane's crew members are baffled. They know only that there's been a loud noise, some sort of explosion, a subsequent drop in cabin pressure, and a growing loss of control. Yet their instruments offer no clues to the mystery. Engines. Oh, engines okay. Ominously, right the pilots can't right get the plane right to respond. It's dropping! Right turn. Right turn. Hydraulic pressure. It's dropping! The plane's flight controls are powered by hydraulic pressure. The elevator, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, and ailerons, which make it turn. On a big modern jet, all these are too heavy to operate with cables and levers. Instead, they're controlled by hydraulic fluid, which flows in pipes around the aircraft. It's the lifeblood of the plane. Tokyo, Japan Air, one, two, three, request immediate trouble. Request return back to Haneda, move up. Roger, approved as you request. Turn right to heading 090. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Nothing seems to be working. All the controls are dead. They're 7,300 meters up in the air, traveling at nearly 540 kilometers an hour and unable to control the plane. In the growing uncertainty of the situation, the pilots know they need to get down fast. The controller is puzzled. Instead of making the anticipated 180 degree turn back to the airport, the plane now veers off its course, but not towards Haneda. No. No. Ah, uh, 123. Negative. 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 Please confirm that you are declaring emergency. That's right? That's affirmative. Request the nature of your emergency. Hydraulic pressure all lost. All lost? No. Look. All lost. Yes. The company, please. Make a request to the company, please. Do you want to make a fuss? The crew seem paralyzed and don't radio the airline or answer the tower. The officials on the ground don't know that the plane has lost its hydraulic power, but their screens tell them it's flying erratically and is Let's possibly descend. out of control. Right turn, descend. Look at his altitude. Up and down, up and down. But now, on control. Put your heart into it or it's stop. The hydraulics failure has caused a serious problem. For the last few minutes, the plane has begun flying in an alarming pattern. First, it climbs steeply, then tips over and goes into a terrifying dive of 1,200 meters, only to level off and begin to climb again. This repeats itself over and over again. The pilots cannot understand this bizarre behavior, and they are powerless to stop it. Tokyo Area Control, August the 12th, 1985. The controller receives an emergency signal from a jumbo jet that left Haneda Airport 13 minutes ago. Tokyo, Japan Air, one, two, three, request immediate. Trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Move over. the oxygen mask? In the cabin, confusion and panic spread like wildfire. There's been an explosion, and now some passengers are gasping for air. 
Hydraulic pressure has dropped! The plane's precious hydraulic fluid is gone. That's why the flight controls aren't working properly. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Airline personnel are trained to take charge in a crisis, and passenger Yumi Ochiai helps out even though off duty. At Tokyo Control, the controller is now joined by his supervisor. What's that? JAL 123, he's declared an emergency. Says it's uncontrollable. He says he wants to go back to Haneda, but his heading is all wrong. He can't seem to turn. Get him to Nagoya. That'll be the easiest. It's a straight line. The best solution would be for the plane to switch course to Nagoya Airport, which is 128 kilometers straight ahead. But they'd need to start descending immediately if they're going to land there. Right, your position 72, 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you land at Nagoya? Negative. Request back to Haneda. It's a longer runway. The captain wants to try to get back to Haneda. It's a large airport and ideally suited for a jumbo 747 in an emergency. But it's in the opposite direction. If he can get it down. Uh, 123, can you descend? Roger, but the black box shows that he doesn't descend. Without control of the aircraft, they can't. In the thin atmosphere at this altitude, the passengers are finding it difficult to breathe. People without oxygen masks may soon become unconscious. The situation worsens as some of the masks at the back of the plane run out of oxygen. It's been five minutes since the explosion, and a flight attendant is finally able to call the cockpit with news about what's happened to the plane. Yes, what is it? The flight attendant tells the engineer that the explosion has occurred in the rear of the plane and may have come from the baggage compartment. So, there's a baggage compartment the furthest in the rear. Listen, right now the baggage compartment right at the back has collapsed. Uh, I think we'd better descend. They need to get down quickly before the passengers become unconscious. But the captain seems to be struck by a strange paralysis. All the passengers are using their masks. Shall we descend a little? The captain does not reply. It's possible that by now he and his crew are suffering from hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. The R5 pet? At this altitude, the oxygen in their blood starts to fall. First, their judgment may become impaired. Eventually, they may lose consciousness. The R5 pet? Yes, I understand. Captain, the R5 mass have stopped! At the R5 door, the situation is becoming critical. The oxygen supply has failed. The cabin crew have to give the passengers whiffs of oxygen from a gas bottle. Still, the captain and his crew seem to be drowning in confusion. I think we better make an emergency descent. Yes. <clears throat> Shall we use our mask too? We better. I think we better use the oxygen mask. Yes. But they don't put on their masks. No one knows why. It might be indecision or hypoxia beginning to cloud their judgment. At Japan Airlines in Tokyo, flight operations have been alerted to the emergency, but are as mystified as everyone else on the ground. All they know is that over 500 lives are at stake. It's their job to try to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution while the plane is in the air. This is Japan Air Tokyo. Tokyo Control said they received an emergency call from you. It Listen, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh, Roger, is the captain returning to Tokyo? What? Can you return to Haneda? Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, we are making an emergency descent. Uh, we'll contact you again in a little while. Uh, keep monitoring us, please. Uh, Roger. R5 door. Could it have come off? If the door has come off, that could mean an explosive decompression of the cabin as the air rushes out. Passengers may have been sucked out kilometers above the ground. But there's a worse possibility. 
if the door hit the tail of the aircraft, it could have damaged it. The tail keeps the plane stable. Its rudder and elevators make the plane go up and down or side to side. If the tail is damaged, flight operations will be powerless to assist them. In Tokyo, news that a Japan Airlines jumbo jet is in trouble has leaked almost immediately. Japanese television is already breaking into regular programming with live interviews. Someone saw the crippled jet fly overhead. I knew the plane was in trouble, he is saying. It was swaying back and forth. Then it disappeared in a cloud. Flight 123's meandering route has put it in range of an American Air Force base at Yokota on the northern outskirts of Tokyo. An American controller there has overheard the conversations between the plane and Tokyo Air Traffic Control. He wants to help to offer Yokota runway for landing. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota approach. If you hear me, contact Yokota. The pilots are preoccupied and don't respond. Since they've lost all normal control of the plane, they're now testing the throttles to see what happens. They can make the plane go faster or slower. At least they have speed at their command. As they experiment, they find that if they push the throttles forward when the plane is diving, making the engines go faster, it actually makes the plane come out of the dive and brings the nose up. And if they pull back the throttles when it's climbing, slowing the engines, the nose tips and begins to dive. These actions are the opposite of what a pilot would normally do, but it seems to work, and they begin to flatten out the mad roller coaster ride. Then a second experiment. By applying more thrust to the engines on the left side of the aircraft, they manage to slowly turn the plane right in the general direction of Tokyo. But then their luck runs out. In the frantic juggling of throttles, the pilots get out of step. It drives the 747 into a frenzy. Gear down! Gear down! Should put the gear down! Lowering the landing gear should slow the plane down and make it more stable. Doesn't work. Should I lower the alternate? For safety, 747s employ an electrically run system, separate from the hydraulics, that can lower the landing gear in an emergency. While the engines are turning, they still have electric power. Lowering the landing gear helps stabilize the plane. The drag of the undercarriage has a dampening effect on the pitching motion. But it also destroys the directional control they were getting by applying more power to one side of the aircraft. Max power. Close to Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, the plane makes an abrupt turn to the right and begins a terrifying dive. The plane is falling at 900 meters a minute, twice the normal rate of descent. We're going down. Heavy. Put the wheel all the way. All the way. It's all the way. Not heavy. Get the gear down. There is no need for alarm. The, the plane's black box records the flight attendant still trying to calm the passengers. Japan Air, one, two, three, uncontrollable. He's going to hit the mountain. Tokyo control, Tokyo control, good day to you, sir. This is... All station, all station except the Japan Air, 123, keep silent until further advised. Uncontrollable. Understood. Do you wish to contact... Stay with us, please. Stay with us. Just as suddenly, the plane comes out of its dive. They've dropped over 3,000 meters. They're now in amongst towering mountains, but at least there's more oxygen at this altitude. The pilots have been fighting the plane for an intense 22 minutes since the explosion. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. Applying maximum power in order to lift the nose is their only option. In their 
efforts to control the plane, they've allowed the speed to drop too much. To escape the mountain, they need maximum power to generate more speed and more lift. The passengers grasp the seriousness of the situation. Many of them prepare for the end. But increasing power to avoid the mountains has caused the plane to resume its wayward up and down motions. Having run out of options, the crew is forced to repeat the same futile procedures over and over. They've been fighting the plane for nearly 30 minutes now. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota. The air traffic controllers, Japanese and American, are desperate to help, to give Flight 123 any information or reassurance they can. Request a radar vector to Haneda. Roger, understood. Keep heading 090. But frustratingly, the plane continues heading off to the northwest, away from both Haneda Airport and Yokota Air Base. Now, with every rise and fall of the plane, they're barely above the mountaintops. Can you control the aircraft now? An ominous silence descends on area control. Japan Air 123, switch your radio frequency to 119.7. 119.7, please. They try changing radio frequency. If you can, change the frequency to 119.7. There is no reply. If you read, come up on 119.7, we are all ready. Your position, five, uh, four or five miles northwest of Haneda. In the tensions of the moment, the controller is a bit confused and mistakes the plane's distance from Haneda. Northwest of Haneda? How many miles? Yes, that is correct. On our radar, you're 55, five, five miles northwest. We are ready for your approach at any time. Yokota is also available for landing. Let us know your intentions. Over. At Haneda Airport, emergency services are being mobilized for the plane, wherever it can touch down. Yes, watch all. They say we're 25 miles west of Kumagaya. Suddenly, the plane goes into a steep dive, the worst yet. Stop the flap. Power! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Power! The plane is falling at 5,500 meters a minute. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, can you hear me? Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, do you read? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123 is gone. At Tokyo Control, they've lost contact with the Japan Airlines jumbo jet full of passengers. An American plane flying in the area has been listening in to the drama of Flight 123 and reports seeing flames in the mountains some hundred kilometers west of Tokyo. One of the C-130 pilots later said that they even guided a rescue helicopter to the scene. 
and American Marines stood by ready to rappel down to the burning wreckage. But before they could do so, they were ordered to return to base. Rivalry between the various Japanese emergency forces is reported to have caused confusion and delays as the victims of the crash wait for help. During the night, the Japanese self-defense force arrives on the scene. A helicopter flown by Captain Isuzu Omori finds the crash site. The pilot radios in. Minokayama, Victor 107. I see something. I see flames in about 10 spots over an area of about 300 meters square. Victor 107, Minokayama, is there any sign of survivors? Victor 107, no signs of survivors. Visibility poor, too much smoke. Victor 107, can you land to investigate? Not a chance. It's a 45 degree slope down there. No more to put down, and there's fire everywhere. Seeing no sign of survivors and unwilling to risk a landing at night, Captain Omori returns to base. Meanwhile, a team of rescuers is on its way by road. But since they don't expect to find anyone alive, they spend the night in a village 68 kilometers from the crash site. At the crash site, the passengers of Flight 123 lie dying. The next morning, the last moments of Flight 123 start to become clear. The 747 sliced a path through the trees near the top of Mount Osutaka, one of the mountains north of Mount Fuji. The plane finally hit a ridge several hundred meters further on and exploded. The wreckage and passengers then tumbled down the steep side of the mountain. It's now 14 hours after the crash and the Japanese self-defense force rescue team arrives at the scene. they are confronted with the worst single aircraft accident in history. They're shocked to find a survivor. It's the off-duty flight attendant, Yumi Ochiai, still hanging on to life. She is not the only one. Rescuers find a 12-year-old girl wedged in the branches of a tree and airlift her to safety. Incredibly, two more passengers are alive, a young mother and her eight-year-old daughter. It's nothing short of a miracle But how have these four survived? The human body is believed to be able to stand a forward deceleration of up to 25 times the force of gravity. But investigators report that from the speed at which the aircraft hit the ground, those at the front of the plane experienced a sudden stop of over 100 Gs. The four survivors are hurried to a hospital in Fujioka City. Investigators will soon discover that all four of the surviving passengers were seated in the last seven rows. This is how they survived. In the back of the 747, the impact forces were much less. Sheer luck had protected them from the flying debris. 
Yumi Ochiai has a broken pelvis and a fractured arm. She tells a disturbing story of what happened as she lay on the mountain, awaiting rescue, and that many more passengers survived the crash. After the crash, I heard harsh panting and gasping noises from many people. I heard it coming from everywhere, all around me. There was a boy crying, Mother. I clearly heard a young woman saying, Come quickly. Suddenly, I heard a boy's voice. OK, I'll hang on, he said. It sounded like the voice of a boy of about school age. In the darkness, I could hear the sound of a helicopter. I couldn't see any light, but I could hear the sound, and it was quite near too. We'll be saved, I thought, and waved frantically. But the helicopter went further away. Don't go, I waved desperately. Help, but it faded. I could no longer hear the voices of the boy or the young woman. It's clear now that many died in the cold night air, waiting for rescue. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now another 520 dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned of the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his opposite number in Japan, begging him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many of the major foreign investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo where he'll meet the rest of his team, representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schleed found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. Schleed had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. Schleed found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. There were scores of helicopters in the air, landing and taking off every couple minutes. Amidst the wreckage of JAL-123, Schleed found that some families of the victims had managed to scramble to the remote mountain site on foot and build shrines to their loved ones. From above, flowers rained down on the investigators. 
I recall these big white, I believe they were Chinook helicopters, flying over, and uh, there were families aboard the helicopters looking at the accident site. They were quite high, and they were dropping flower, flower petals down onto the accident site. The one thing that we found uh, when we got to the accident site was that many of the passengers had a lot of time to think about the end. And uh, they found many, many notes written on pieces of paper, anything they could get their hands on. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Our children have grown up to be people I am proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Passengers were able to think and realize that they were out of control and maybe going to crash. So they wrote notes to their loved ones and left them in the back of the seats or in their pockets. But what could have caused this disaster? Neither the heart-rending letters nor the tangled wreckage yet yield any answer to what happened to Flight 123. Still, the main thing the investigators have to go on are the words on the plane's cockpit voice recorder, those of the plane's flight engineer who had said that door R5 was broken. They believe that the door has somehow come off in flight, crashed into the tail, and damaged the plane's flying surfaces. The horizontal stabilizer, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, which controls side-to-side -side movement. But then, a piece of news that destroys that theory totally. The door had not come off. It's found by the investigators amidst the wreckage. The flight engineer was wrong. Ah, uh, right now the R5 door has broken. The warning light on his panel led him to believe that the door had failed in flight. But the alarm may well have been set off by a short circuit in the electrical system, caused by the ceiling collapsing in the explosion. It was not a broken door that caused Flight 123 to crash. The investigators would have to look elsewhere. Stop the flap! Power! 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 Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! It's up! Japan Airlines Flight 123 has crashed into Mount Osutaka, taking hundreds of lives. Investigators are worried about a hidden fault in the Boeing 747. They need to find the cause of this crash quickly. A photograph taken by an amateur photographer provides the first clue to the mystery of why the plane became unflyable. There's something odd about the image. Photographic technicians put it on a computer and work hard to enhance the photograph to sharpen up its blurred lines. Finally, they get a clear enough picture. The whole huge tail fin of the airplane is missing. It's what keeps the plane steady. Since most of the plane's hydraulic fluid lines pass through the fin, it starts to make sense why they lost hydraulic pressure and control of the plane. Then, a Japanese Navy ship steaming across the bay south of Tokyo came upon the plane's tail fin floating on the sea. It's at the very spot where the plane had first reported an emergency. Investigators are now certain that the starting point of the accident must have something to do with the tail of the aircraft. They review the known facts. Something had caused the ceiling at the back of the plane to collapse. There had been an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Whatever it was also ripped off the tail fin and the main hydraulic lines with it, making the plane uncontrollable. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. At last, 
Explosion, decompression, loss of the tail fin and hydraulic failure. The investigators need to find out what links these four elements together. Routinely, the investigators begin by looking back into the plane's history, and they make an intriguing discovery. The plane had been in another accident seven years earlier. The pilot landed the plane with its nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. There had been a repair to the rear part of the airplane, including the rear pressure bulkhead. Well, all modern jets, uh, aircraft, when they climb, they have to be pressurized to keep the cabin to a reasonable level for the passengers. So let's take a 747. When the 747 is on the ground, it's actually somewhat oval-shaped. And as it climbs and pressurizes, it becomes more circular. The rear pressure bulkhead is like a huge metal umbrella lying on its side at the very back of the plane. Its purpose is to stop pressurized air escaping from the cabin out through the tail of the aircraft. It must be very, very heavy and strong because the forces are tremendous. They're over 8 uh, psi differential, very a lot of pressure. The design of a 747 aft pressure bulkhead was what they call a dome. And uh, it was uh, designed to take the pressure with a lot less heavy metal, and it's a, it's a typical design. It's a pressure dome. Seven years earlier, Japan Airlines called in Boeing to repair the cracked bulkhead. Boeing engineers spliced a new panel into the damaged bulkhead. But at the accident site of Flight 123 in 1985, Ron Schleed stumbled across a piece of wreckage that unraveled the whole mystery. It was a piece of this new panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. To explain to the Japanese investigators what he discovered, Ron Schleed sketched out how the repair should have been made and the mistake that had been made. It was a catastrophic error. The rivets were carrying twice the force they should have been. One of the FA engineers there did some calculations for us based on this earlier repair of the bulkhead. And his theory was if the repair wasn't done correctly, for example, if they had not put the rivets in properly and they only had one row of rivets holding the bulkhead together versus two as designed, that it possibly could, it would fail prematurely. The FAA engineer calculated that the faulty repair to the bulkhead would fail after 10,000 flights. From the moment the repair was done, it was simply a matter of time. The investigators found that a simple human error had led to this. summer's evening in 1985, Japan Air 123 lifts off from Haneda Airport. It's the 12,319th takeoff since the repair of the damaged bulkhead, a repair that the investigators calculated would only hold for 10,000 flights. As the plane climbs to 7,300 meters, the air outside gets thinner and thinner but the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference of pressure between the passenger cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks began to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a hole in it two to three meters square, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft 
and simply blows it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know, and will never know, that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail, and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the fugoid cycle. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives sometimes several hundred meters at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! Turn with the gear down! To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains. An amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset, uh, uh, personally uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. The Japanese police wanted to bring criminal charges against Boeing for its part in the tragedy, but the prosecutors decided not to go ahead. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane continues on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. However, Japan Airlines, the innocent party, had no such comfort. After I left uh, the scene and came home, it was my understanding that one of the senior Japanese Airlines uh, uh, maintenance managers actually committed suicide. The Japanese Airlines president resigned. The bookings slumped. Rumors abounded in Japan that the airline was indeed guilty and that Boeing was just taking the rap for a valuable customer. It's taken years for Japan Airlines to recover from this experience, the worst single plane crash in history.